Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, then check out the Virgo Potens website at virgopotens.org. Please consider supporting this work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this Virgo Potens YouTube channel. Thank you. Candlemas and Tradition Resurrected by Tony Capobianco Candlemas is celebrated on February 2nd. This holy day in the church is also known by two other names. One ancient title for this day is the Purification of the Blessed Virgin. Another name for this day is the Presentation of Jesus in the Temple. All three of these names beautifully capture the deep, sacred mystery celebrated on this, the last day of the holy season of Christmas. Unfortunately, much of the Church's traditions in celebrating this day have been ignored over the past few centuries. This is a shame because the tradition is sublime and offers much nourishment for the children of Holy Mother Church. Fortunately, traditional Candlemas celebrations are being resurrected in Catholic churches around the world. Prince of Peace Catholic Church in South Carolina is an inspiring example of one such Catholic Church that is helping to resurrect tradition. This article will look at the sublime mysteries that the Church places before us on this, the second day of February. We will use the magnificent commentary of the spiritual master, Abbot Dom Prosper Geringer, to elaborate upon the purification of the Blessed Virgin and the presentation of Jesus in the Temple. These two holy events in the lives of our Lord and Our Lady are the reason that the Church gives us the beautiful traditional ceremony of the blessing of candles, from which the name Candlemas derives. How old is the Church's tradition of celebrating the purification of the Blessed Virgin? What did the Jewish purification law command? If Mary is without sin, why did she participate in the Jewish purification law? Was it becoming that Mary should observe these laws? Did seeking this external rite of purification risk failing in respect due to her virginity or the honor of her divine son? What is the meaning of the names of the cities of Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Jerusalem? What is the significance of the presentation of Jesus in the temple? What do candles have to do with the purification of the Blessed Virgin and the presentation of Jesus in the temple? Has there been an effort to destroy the exterior rites and practices of the Catholic tradition? What can priests do to counter the war on tradition? These questions will be answered through citing excerpts from the liturgical year by Dom Prosper Geringer. The remainder of this article, excluding my commentary in the conclusion, will be in a question and answer format with Abbot Dom Prosper Geringer as we extrapolate his answers from his magnum opus, The Liturgical Year, as though I am interviewing him. How old is the Church's tradition of celebrating the purification of the Blessed Virgin? Quote, Several learned writers, among whom we may mention Pope Benedict XIV, are of the opinion that this solemnity was instituted by the apostles themselves. This much is certain, that it was a long-established feast even in the 5th century. By another ordinance of the law, every firstborn son was to be considered as belonging to God, and was to be redeemed by six sides, each side weighing, according to the standard of the temple, twenty obols. Leviticus 12, Exodus 30, 13. The obol was about three and a half pence of English money. End quote. From Dom Prosper Geringer, The Liturgical Year. What did the Jewish purification law command? Quote, the law commanded that a woman who had given birth to a son should not approach the tabernacle for the term of 40 days, after which time she was to offer a sacrifice for her purification. She was to offer up a lamb as a holocaust, and a turtle or dove as a sin offering. But if she were poor and could not provide a lamb, she was to offer in its steed a second turtle or dove, end quote, from the liturgical year of Dom Prosper Geringer. If Mary is without sin, why did she participate in the Jewish purification law? Was it becoming that Mary should observe these laws? Quote, if she considered the spirit of these legal enactments, and why God required the ceremony of purification, it was evident that she was not bound to them. They, for whom these laws had been made, were espoused to men. Mary was the chaste spouse of the Holy Ghost. 
a virgin in conceiving and a virgin in giving birth to her son. Her purity had ever been spotless as that of the angels, but it received an incalculable increase by her carrying the God of all sanctity in her womb and bringing him into this world. Moreover, when she reflected upon her child being the creator and sovereign Lord of all things, how could she suppose that he was to be submitted to the humiliation of being ransomed as a slave whose life and person are not his own? And yet the Holy Spirit revealed to Mary that she must comply with both these laws. She, the Holy Mother of God, must go to the temple like other Hebrew mothers, as though she had lost something which needed restoring by a legal sacrifice. He, that is, the Son of God and Son of Man, must be treated in all things as though he were a servant, and be ransomed in common with the poorest Jewish boy. Mary adores the will of God and embraces it with her whole heart. End quote. Dom Prosper Geringe, The Liturgical Year. Did seeking this external rite of purification risk failing in respect due to her virginity or the honor of her divine son? Quote, The same divine plan which had required that Mary should be espoused to Joseph in order that her fruitful virginity might not seem strange in the eyes of the people, now obliged her to come, like other Israelite mothers, to offer the sacrifice of purification for the birth of her son, whom she had conceived by the operation of the power of the Holy Ghost, but who was to be presented in the temple as the son of Mary, the spouse of Joseph. Thus it is that infinite wisdom delights in showing that his thoughts are not our thoughts, and in disconcerting our notions, he claims the submissiveness of our confidence until the time come that he has fixed for withdrawing the veil and showing himself to our astonished view. Divine will was dear to Mary, in this as in every circumstance of her life. The Holy Virgin knew that by seeking this external rite of purification, she was in no wise risking the honor of her child, or failing in the respect due to her own virginity. She was in the temple of Jerusalem what she was in the house of Nazareth. When she received the archangel's visit, she was the handmaid of the Lord. Luke 1.38 She obeyed the law because she seemed to come under the law. Her God and her Son submitted to the ransom as humbly as the poorest Hebrew would have to do. He had already obeyed the edict of the Emperor Augustus in the general census. He was to be obedient even unto death, even to death of the cross. The mother and the child both humbled themselves in the purification, and man's pride received on that day one of the greatest lessons ever given it. End quote. From Dom Prosper Geringer's The Liturgical Year. What is the meaning of the names of the cities of Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Jerusalem? Quote, At length, the Holy Family entered Jerusalem. The name of this holy city signifies vision of peace, and Jesus comes to bring her peace. Let us consider the names of the three places in which our Redeemer began, continued, and ended his life on earth. He is conceived at Nazareth, which signifies a flower, and Jesus is, as he tells us in the canticle, the flower of the field and the lily of the valley. Canticles, Song of Songs, 2-1. By whose fragrance we are refreshed. He is born at Bethlehem, the house of bread, for he is the nourishment of our souls. He dies on the cross in Jerusalem, and by his blood he restores peace between heaven and earth, peace between men, peace within our own souls, and on this day of his mother's purification, we shall find him giving us the pledge of this peace. End quote. From Dom Prosper Geringer, The Liturgical Year. What is the significance of the presentation of Jesus in the temple? Quote, Whilst Mary, the living Ark of the Covenant, is ascending the steps which lead up to the temple, carrying Jesus in her arms, let us be attentive to the mystery. One of the most celebrated of the prophecies is about to be accomplished. One of the principal characters of the Messiah is about to be shown as belonging to this infant. We have already had the other predictions fulfilled of his being conceived of a virgin and born in Bethlehem. Today, he shows us a further title to our adoration. He enters the temple. 
The hour is come for the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Emmanuel has left Bethlehem. He has come among the people. He is about to take possession of his temple, and the mere fact of his entering it will straightways give it a glory which is far above that of its predecessor. He will often visit it during his mortal life, but his coming to it today, carried as he is in Mary's arms, is enough for the accomplishment of the promise, and all the shadows and figures of this temple at once pale before the rays of the Son of Truth and Justice. The blood of the oxen and goats will, for a few years more, flow on its altar, but the infant who holds in his veins the blood that is to redeem the world is at this moment standing near that very altar. Amidst the priests who are there, and amidst the crowd of Israelites who are moving to and fro in the sacred building, there are a few faithful ones who are in expectation of the Deliverer, and they know that the time of his manifestation is at hand. But there is not one among them all who knows that at that very moment this expected Messiah is under the same roof with himself." End quote. From the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Geringer. What do candles have to do with the purification of the Blessed Virgin and the presentation of Jesus in the Temple? Quote, the mystery of today's ceremony has frequently been explained by liturgists, dating from the 7th century. According to St. Ivo of Chartres, his Sermon on the Purification, the wax which is formed from the juice of flowers by the bee, which has always been considered as the emblem of virginity, signifies the virginal flesh of the divine infant, who diminished not, either by his conception or his birth, the spotless purity of his blessed mother. The same holy bishop would have us see, in the flame of our candle, a symbol of Jesus, who came to enlighten our darkness. St. Anselm, his narration on St. Luke, Archbishop of Canterbury, speaking on the same mystery, bids us consider three things in the blessed candle. The wax, the wick, and the flame. The wax, he says, which is the production of the virginal bee, is the flesh of our Lord. The wick, which is within, is his soul. The flame which burns on the top is his divinity. End quote. From Dom Prosper Geringer's The Liturgical Year. Has there been an effort to destroy the exterior rites and practices of Catholic tradition? What can priests do to counter the war on tradition? Quote, Formerly, the faithful looked upon it as an honor to be permitted to bring their wax tapers to the church on this feast of the purification, that they might be blessed together with those which were to be borne in the procession by the priests and sacred ministers. And the same custom is still observed in some congregations. It would be well if pastors were to encourage this practice, retaining it where it exists, or establishing it where it is not known. There has been such a systemic effort made to destroy, or at least to impoverish the exterior rites and practices of religion, that we find throughout the world thousands of Christians who have been insensibly made strangers to those admirable sentiments of faith, which the Church alone in her liturgy can give to the body of the faithful. Thus, we shall be telling many what they have never heard before, when we inform them that the Church blesses the candles today, not only to be carried in the procession, which forms part of the ceremony, but also for the use of the faithful, inasmuch as they draw upon such as use them with respect, whether on sea or on land, as the Church says in the prayer of special blessings from heaven, these blessed candles ought also to be lit near the bed of the dying Christian as a symbol of the immortality merited for us by Christ and of the protection of our Blessed Lady." End quote. From Dom Prosper Geringer's The Liturgical Year. Candlemas and the Purification of the Blessed Virgin is an ancient, beautiful, deep, and rich tradition of the Catholic Church. The unfathomable depth of the sacred mysteries of this day are truly something that we could spend all eternity pondering in paradise without ever exhausting the sweet fruit of divine contemplation. Studying the purification of the Blessed Virgin also provides much material which will fuel our meditations on the joyful mysteries of the Holy Rosary. The traditional exterior rites and practices of the Catholic Church draw her children into the transcendent spiritual realm of faith and Almighty God. 
These sublime mysteries found in these ancient rites nourish the soul, as people are lifted beyond the mundane, often monotonous daily repetition of mortal life here in this veil of tears. Humans are a body and soul composite, and if we neglect our spiritual component, then we will become spiritually sick, just as the human body will become sick if it is malnourished or starved. Jesus Christ has chosen to nourish us through his holy Catholic Church, and we would be negligent if we did not seek his nourishment in the means that he has chosen to give us. Candlemas is a day in which the Church wisely places these spiritual truths before us in a joyful celebration of the end of the holy season of Christmas. As Abbot Dom Prosper Garanger pointed out, the attack on the exterior rites and practices of true religion was already well underway in his day. Generations of Catholics in most places have been deprived of the nourishing Catholic traditions which should be theirs by birthright and as part of their heritage as tradition inherently passes on from generation to generation. While it is sorrowful and frustrating to come to the realization that the ancient traditions, such as Candlemas, have largely been abandoned, it is extremely encouraging to see the recovery of this beautiful tradition taking place today. Catholic parishes around the world are joyfully bringing back the exterior rites and practices of Candlemas, Deo Gracias. Prince of Peace Catholic Church in South Carolina is one brilliant example of a parish church leading the charge in restoring tradition. On February 2, 2020, Prince of Peace Catholic Church will be celebrating Candlemas in a big way. Led by their priests, especially by Father Christopher Smith, they will be having the traditional Candlemas procession, which will culminate with the offering of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the majestic splendor of the traditional Latin Mass. Please support parishes like Prince of Peace Catholic Church, which are fighting daily to help recover and promote the beautiful Catholic tradition. If your parish doesn't observe the traditional Candlemas rites, prayerfully consider asking your priest if he could plan to do so in the future. Tradition is restored one parish at a time. Tradition is rising. Much like the candles which are processed on Candlemas, tradition is a pure light shining in the darkness. In the resurrection of Christ, his glory shined brilliantly for all who looked upon him to see. And so too, the resurrection of tradition shines forth for the glory of Jesus Christ and his church. The resurrection of tradition magnifies the glory of the Catholic Church so that she may shine in spectacular splendor. Learning about and living out the liturgical year that Holy Mother Church has wisely placed before us will greatly assist us in growing in sanctity. The Church knows how to raise saints, and it is our responsibility to make this our highest priority, out of love for God. Resurrect the traditional observance of Candlemas and follow the saints of ages past as we enter into the deep mysteries of the liturgical year. The resurrection of Catholic tradition will glorify Christ and his church as the light which it produces scatters the gloomy shadow of darkness which permeates this age. <laughs>